everybody. Welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Ardo Cal here every Tuesday, Friday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well. The NHL on ESPN YouTube. Huge mm. tilt wish oh. between the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Boston Bruins. What? Except it happened at Rico or at Coca-Cola Coliseum where the Marlies play. What? And it happened during an AEW pro wrestling event. That's right. Adam <laughs> Copeland, Christian Cage, good friends, better enemies, battling it out for championship on the line. They make their way to the penalty box wish, and then all hell broke loose. It did. By the way, friend of the show, Adam Copeland. We should uh, give him the proper title. A uh, big fan yes. of the drop. Yes. Uh, they. So it was an I quit match, which, of course, meant that it was no holds barred. I mean, they're fighting all over the place, including in the penalty box. For those who didn't see it, it was amazing. They're fighting in the penalty box. OK, then uh, Adam Copeland reaches over and grabs a Bruins jersey off a fan that is <laughs> uh, standing near the penalty box, places it on Christian Cage. Christian obviously had been pummeled into a, a, a state of, of complete confusion. He starts putting on the Bruins jersey, Arda. Yeah. He uh-huh. starts putting his arms like the natural motion uh, that you have when you put on a jersey. He's just he doesn't know what he, where he is right now. He, so he puts on the Bruins jersey. And then Adam Copeland goes and takes a Leafs jersey yeah. off another fan standing near the penalty box. And now you've got Adam Copeland as a Leaf. You got Christian Cage as a Bruin. And they engage in what I can only describe Arda as a Matt Rempe week one slobber knocker of a fight in the penalty box. Truly one of the better crossover moments for hockey that we've had this year. Absolutely. And it couldn't have happened to two nicer guys, uh, Adam Copeland and Christian Cage. You knew that they would be the ones if there was ever going to be this level of hockey and pro wrestling crossover. uh, It would be those two. Uh, (laughs) Speaking of Christian Cage, I had a chance to see him uh, in Tampa when I was down last month. Uh, He's frequently at Tampa Bay Lightning games. If there's one guy in all seriousness, I do want to say this. If there's one guy that you would choose in the pro wrestling world that would make a great hockey analyst, Christian Cage would be either at the top of that list or absolutely in the conversation. He wow. like his his hockey knowledge level is like analyst worthy. He's he's very like he loves hockey. He deep dives hockey. Like we were talking about Tampa's power play units. You know what I mean? Like not just like cursory fan type stuff. Yeah. So you know, he obviously grew up a wrestling fan. He played goal or I mean, a hockey fan. He played in net. He was a goaltender for a while as well. But uh, yeah, putting it out there in the universe, Christian Cage, hockey analyst. <laughs> there you go. If only we worked at a television network that could make such things happen. Yeah, exactly. We need him on our <laughs> lightning games. Uh, speaking of puck headlines, because that absolutely is a puck headline. Uh, let's go around the hockey world. Dateline. Eastern Conference. My goodness, wish speaking of Royal Rumbles and Battle Royals, the Eastern Conference wild card race has about eight teams yeah. still battling for these two spots. What's going on, man? It's like three spots. So, uh, let's let's throw the Lightning in there, even though their percentage to make the playoffs is quite high. It's it's the third spot in the Metro, the two wild card spots, and you have just all of these teams still on the hunt, including teams like the Devils and the Sabers that are hanging around. The Penguins look like they don't really want to be there anymore, but that's fine. Uh, it, it is an absolutely wild finish to the season uh, with all these teams climbing over each other. One night, one team looks like they're up. The other night, they looks like, it looks like they're down. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it's still the Flyers and the Lightning and the driver's seats with the Red Wings uh, trying to hang on as best they can. Um, but as far as playoff races go, man, again, it's a little bit hapless. I think I called some of these teams mid last episode. Mm. I won't take it back. Um, but it doesn't lack for drama, though, that's for sure. We are in the mid-dull of the general manager's Ooh. meetings. Dateline, NHL GM meetings. Uh, some interesting proposed rule changes yeah. that have emerged from the GM meetings. Fill us in, Wish. Well, you know, everybody has a different opinion about the use of uh, video review in the league. And are we doing it too <laughs> much? Are we doing it too little? Most people say too much. But the GMs want to expand it further to include puck shot over the glass and high sticking minor penalties in which they believe uh, the wrong call was made because the stick causing the infraction did not belong to the team being penalized. On the puck over the glass ones, uh, only 14 times in the last 766 uh, puck over the glass calls only 14 times has it been called incorrectly when it was uh, it hit the glass or it was somebody it hit somebody else's stick or what have you. But again, like they've created video reviews for things that 
happen even on a more rarer basis. So I'm okay with it. I, I'm okay with that. The minor high sticking infraction thing, again, they, they already use it for, for bigger, you know, double minors and things like that. So like, I, I'm, I'm okay with that too. Um, because the downside for both of these Arda is that if you get it wrong, not only does the penalty called on you stand, you get an extra delay of game penalty as well. So you're basically giving your opponent a five on three. So there is a huge gamble. You got to make sure you're right. There, this is not going to be overused, in other words, uh, by these teams because of the downside to it. Dateline Dallas Stars Twitter. The Stars celebrated their <laughs> win over the Arizona Coyotes this week by tweeting an AI-generated photo of a green pickup truck having run over a coyote on a desert highway. After fan backlash, they set the image behind a sensitive content image blocker. Led out to the Coyotes tweeting out, getting flagged for sensitive content with a squirmy face emoji <laughs> and a screenshot of job application in dallas ouch greg ouch every every year there's one twitter account or x account sorry elon uh where somebody <laughs> the way just, you said that somebody sorry. just just gets over their skis a little bit and trying to be too snarky and uh and this was a good case of it we, we don't need to see roadkill i don't think <laughs> to really emphasize the importance of a regular season victory uh, and, and so, yeah, they had to set it to a sensitive content warning type deal. And the coyotes, uh, were then, uh, walked through the open door to completely dunk on the, uh, social media team for the Dallas stars. Let's just have a no, a no road kill, uh, um, you know, rule for, for AI I think it's fair. graphics. Yeah. I think we'll it's completely that. fair. I will say this and I'm not, com I'm not defending this particular image. Okay. What I will say is that. The social media team, the content managers, they have a unenviable at times challenging task of thinking of ways to generate as much buzz and clicks and likes and retweets and shares and views, quite frankly, as possible. Mm -hmm. Right. That, exactly. that is how they are measured. Yeah, exactly. That is, that is a large part uh, the basis of their job and how they are adjudicated, right? Yep. Okay. We'll with get that to... said, w sorry. With that said, uh, you know, they, there's still a sandbox in which they need to play. Right. Okay. Next uh, headline: Dateline Arda Ocal, fan of AI generated dead animals. It says I don't remember that being on the run. <laughs> Definitely not what I was saying. Thank you for <laughs> just blasting the door open. I was, I was, I was, I was singing the plight of the social media manager. But anyhow, uh, speaking of social media content, though, uh, and sticking with Arizona, uh, we got some new images, uh, yeah. whether they were AI generated or not. Uh, state of the art arena that the Coyotes plan to build on land in Phoenix if they win a public auction this summer. I can already see your reaction there. Well, with my, your... My, my reaction is to the images coming out because they were accidentally leaked by the team itself <laughs> oh they were before, leaks okay they, they were i mean they were released by the team before they were supposed to be released and then they okay. were then sent around uh, social media so the coyotes coyoting themselves a little bit there um you know the, the news about the coyotes obviously is this this land auction uh it should be posted publicly within the next couple of days as we do this podcast uh it's in phoenix uh the auctions this summer if they win the auction they plan on building that beautiful state-of-the-art arena that you may have seen floating around social media on that land um at this week's general managers meetings in florida deputy commissioner bill daly was asked whether the nhl would be able to pivot and have the Coyotes play elsewhere next season if the bid is not successful. And Daly indicated that the timing of the auction probably means the Coyotes are likely in Arizona next season, uh, saying they are current. They are going to play hockey games in Arizona next year. Currently, uh, that doesn't mean that the NHL doesn't have contingency plans. Um, but I asked Javier Gutierrez, the president of the Coyotes, if there's a chance the Coyotes could go through this whole this whole process, bidding on the land, trying to build the arena, yada yada yada. And the NHL still decides it wants to relocate the franchise, most likely to, San, uh, to Salt Lake City. And he said, quote, I have no idea. I can't comment on that because I have no idea. I can tell you that, that they are very happy with the plan that we put in front of them. They believe that it's a solution. 
I don't know if it resolves the concerns that they may have or other folks may have, like the Players Association. The sense I've gotten is that they're happy that we have a plan and that it'll be public and we can move forward. Basic, basic gist of my conversation with Gutierrez, Arda, is that there is still very much a concern about this team playing in Mullet Arena for the next few seasons. Mm -hmm. And if the arena plan comes through, it will not be until fall 2027 that they'll get into this new arena. By the way, that's the same timeline they said they had for the Tempe arena that failed. But it's going to be a few more years at Mullet. They do have option years built into their deal to get them to 2027. But uh, for guys like Marty Walsh, who have already gone, you know, rip city on them playing in a, a college hockey arena, uh, we'll have to see how this whole scenario sets well with them. And this new arena, these leaks, I mean, this is still contingent on them getting this land. Yeah, like, this correct. is not a guarantee. That's correct. That's but the, the other but thing the land, stress. the land they're bidding on is zoned for a hockey arena in an ironic twist. So we'll oh. that that's at least one obstacle they'll overcome here. Dateline Amazon, a couple of general managers mentioned that the league has signed on to do a behind the scenes series with Amazon that will center around yeah. 10 to 12 star players. It is due for a fall release. I'm very excited about this wish. What is your reaction? Who should be involved? Well, Chris Johnson tweeted this out, and I'm I'm wondering how much work star players is doing here, Arda, because Here's the thing. As much as I want to see things like Nathan McKinnon cooking, <laughs> as much as I want to see things like Austin Matthews designing uh, shoes or something, like I, I would, I want to see the star players and see shades of them that we haven't seen before. But however, when it comes to reality sports television, it is not necessarily the star players that we come. Uh, away from remembering in these things, whether it's Drive to Survive or even going back to the old 24-7 NHL series. I mean, you know, I, I couldn't tell you what Ovechkin did on that series, but I can tell you what Ilya Brzezgalov did on that series. You know what I mean? So, like, I'm hoping that it's a balance between big names and smaller, more interesting players that we are, don't aren't necessarily rise to the level of superstar, because to me, that is what will make this series really work. Yeah, I, Seth Jarvis comes to mind. He's a great yeah. personality. And uh, someone who might also come to mind is TJ Oshi. A great conver conversation, a great personality. And in fact, he joins us right now on The Drop. Joining us here on The Drop, the newest member of the 1000 NHL Games Woo! Club, TJ Oshi, forward for the Washington Camp Capitals, Stanley Cup champion. TJ, right off the top, I have to ask the most important question. Warm-ups, 1,000th game, were you aware or did you have an idea that your entire team would participate in the butt slap ritual? I, I did not. Um, I, I had heard someone joke about it. I think it was a couple days earlier. And... Uh, and so I was on, I was going to take a shot and they were like, whoa, 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 whoa stop. And uh, I turned around and saw all the guys lined up and I was like, all right, here we go. Uh, a <laughs> couple guys got me in the high hamstring, which isn't a great spot to get slashed <laughs> at, but uh, it was, uh, I appreciated it. It's always fun when uh, the guys can have a little fun with guys milestones, whether it's first game, thousandth game. Um, so that was a, that was a good one and a new one. I don't think that one's been done yet. How, yeah. how did the ritual start? Uh, it was probably back in St. Louis. I in warmups, I had went through and kind of tapped everyone on the butt, and um, and then I started doing it here. And uh, Tom Wilson and Michael Latta had slapped me back, and that was the first time that everyone kind of like gave me one back. And then it kind of just turned into a ritual with me and uh, well hitting everyone on like my side of the ice, and then ending with with Tom and Lats, and uh, and then they started smacking me back and. It just kind of turned into a thing. I don't think really anyone knew much about it until the first time I think Tom wasn't playing maybe. And I gave like a fake slap to the air and then, uh, and then people kind of started <laughs> catching on a little bit more. Well, a thousand games, you know, Carl Alsner, uh, who, you know, real well uh, said, this might be the toughest thousand games that anyone has ever played in the NHL based on how you play and based on having to overcome all the injuries you've faced. So what does it mean to set this mark in your career? Uh, it's, it's pretty important. I, uh, there's no, um, other milestones that I really set for myself in my career. Um, I wasn't looking at, you know, goals or assist marks. Um, it was, uh, 
games played was kind of the big one. It's something that I had looked up to the most out of the guys that came before me, um, playing with guys that had reached uh, the a thousand the the thousand game mark. Um, seeing the ceremonies, seeing the silver stick out there, um, it's a it's a it's a pretty cool thing, and it's uh it's it's tough to do. It's a lot harder than I thought it was, honestly. <laughs> and I think you uh when you have to go through it yourself, um, in uh the fashion that I did and the amount of time it it kind of took, especially these last hundred games or so, um, it's a it's a tough mark to get to get to. Uh. You know, you're not 25 anymore flying around, not needing to warm up or cool down <laughs> or anything. So it uh, definitely takes its toll, but um, all worth it. And really the only milestone that, uh, like I said, that I was looking for. Take us back to those younger days, man. And it's like 2015. You've put down roots in St. Louis. You've established yourself. You're on a long term contract at that point. Do you remember what your emotions were when you found out you were being traded to the Capitals? Yeah, I think I think originally um, you know, you kind of feel like a little bit of, uh, like you failed the city and the fans, um, or maybe you were looked at by management as kind of the problem why you guys couldn't get over the hump losing in the first or second, or I think mostly the second round, um, the last couple of years. And, uh, that kind of goes away pretty quickly when you get the next call from, from, uh, from Mac and, uh, hearing how excited he was to get you to join their team and try to be a part of um, their team getting over the, you know, the playoff hump. So it was uh, about five minutes of feeling uh, pretty. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, <laughs> after that, being pretty excited to seeing the possibility of playing with, um, with OV, with, with Backstrom, um, with John Carlson. So uh, it was, uh, it was a pretty, uh, pretty couple different waves of emotion that went over me and uh you know probably the best thing that could have happened to my career really jump-started my career playing with obviously world-class players being uh welcomed in as a as a support guy and and uh kind of an energy guy and um so I've loved my time here we put down roots right away I didn't even think about going to free agency after my two years here and uh so it's been uh, it's been a fun ride Whenever you reach milestones like this, it's always fun to reflect on big moments in the past. Uh, indulge me for a second. I have a couple of TJ Sochi questions for you. Uh, I, I'm very curious. So you score the first shootout goal against Russia, right? Then it goes to round four. We're in the sudden death round. Did you know that you were going to ride it out until the very end? Or were you told each round, hey, go back out there, go back out there? Uh, no, I was told each round. Um, there actually was a point because I, I was going pretty slow down the ice and you're obviously on the, on the Olympic sheet. And so I was actually getting a little tired from skating from their net back to our bench. <laughs> and then by the time I had sat down, you know, cause you kind of got to pick up speed back to the bench cause the Russian players were waiting to go. Um, but I, they didn't tell me. And I especially thought after I missed the two that I missed, um, even though the, I felt like they're probably arguably my the two best moves that I had made, um, that they were going to go somewhere else. I mean, you look at our look at our lineup, um, and he, well, going on the the my second shot, I was like, if you miss, they're going to go to Kaner, they're going to go to Parisi, or you know, they're there's so many different options that they had. Um, so no one ever told me, and after the after the fourth one, I assumed they were going to ride it out, but. Uh, it was a pretty, uh, pretty fun experience. It was, it was not as for me, it was not as, uh, as serious and, uh, nerve wracking as maybe it was for everyone watching on TV. <laughs> oh, it was, it was an amazing moment, obviously, and nerve wracking for all Americans watching. I'm curious, like when you face the same goaltender over and over again, does it get easier? Do you pick up on things? Like what's that process like? Um, I think it, it depends on, um, kind of your success rate and what they're what they're doing how they're reacting um that's actually the first time that i thought about coming down the ice the exact same way in the same manner and making the mm. move around the exact same time mm. um just because i was seeing the same goaltender and you know you only have so many tricks up your sleeve that you kind of got to keep them <laughs> guessing and so uh um I've, I've went in that route i guess ever since um but that was the that second shot was the first time and um 
I think it I think it makes it a little bit more fun that it kind of turns in a little bit of a head game when you're going just one guy in the goalie. Obviously, um Quickie had two guys to think about, so he had to kind of think on the fly a little bit more than I did. Um, but I had some time to think about the move and replay it in my mind before I took the next shot and what might work the next time. So it was uh it was a pretty, pretty fun little duel we had. Yeah, it was awesome. It was like Three goals, five hole, by the way. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. When I panic, uh, that's my spot. You know, <laughs> so, it's, yeah. it, that's it. That's what you get to, gets you on the, on the Today Show. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so on Sunday, the Capitals are going to be wearing number 77 jerseys during warmups, uh, which will be signed and auctioned off by the team. You personally selected the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation as the beneficiary for the jerseys auction. Your late father had Alzheimer's. What does helping that organization mean to you? Um, well, I, I think it's right in the name there, the Drug Discovery Foundation. Um, it uh, They were very instrumental um, when my dad was alive to help him get on the proper um, mix of... Um, of medications to uh, prolong his life at one point to make him a little bit more comfortable. Um, and so um, I was on the phone with them quite a bit um, from uh, my interview after winning the cup until up until I, even now today um, about uh, trying to help out them as much as I could with different charitable things and them obviously helping out, me out with my dad and uh and uh making his the end of his life as enjoyable as they could so it was uh an incredible partnership we're still a partner today and uh for the for the proceeds to go to that means a lot to me means a lot to my family and um especially the people that were very close with my dad that were um his caretakers in uh, in some pretty tough times so um hoping to find a cure out there and um the addf does a great job in in searching for that that's awesome There's another great example of why hockey players are the best uh really good vibes there tj that's really really cool that you're doing that um last question for me uh obviously we're all talking about ovechkin's goal chase uh you've been with him for a very long time i'm actually curious like we're talking about it especially when milestones are hit right like last game he's now 50 away you know, that's a nice round number to cling on to and <laughs> and talk about. But I'm just curious, like as he approaches, every time he scores, as we get closer and closer here, how much is the team talking about it? How much are you guys thinking about it in the locker room? Does it even come up at all? Uh, it doesn't doesn't come up um, in the room. I think it came up a, lo up a little bit more um, as he was passing, you know, fifth, fourth, third, second. Um, but now that he's uh, there's one man standing in his way. Um, it hasn't came up too much. Obviously, it's in the back of our mind. Anytime you get a scoring chance and uh, an eight's a better option, almost always, even if he's covered, um, you know, you try to you try to you try to get him the puck <laughs> last night's no uh, no different. I, I think Stromer was I mean, you don't get a better look than Stromer had right in front of the crease and you still pass it to the side and obviously oh, he tucked it in the corner. So um, it's uh, it's really amazing what what he's what he's doing right now what he's done over his career um i think when you play with him and you see him every day and you're the guy that's joking with him you know sitting next to him in the locker room you forget um how truly special of a player he is how special of a goal scorer he is and uh you almost get a little spoiled with kind of seeing a lot of that greatness every day so um it's not until you sit back and really look at how many goals it was. I think I just got like my 300th a couple of weeks, like a month ago. And like, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is like the biggest <laughs> thing for me. Um, that was 300. He actually told me right after he was like, he said, I, I, I think we we're in the locker room and he's like, he's like 300 bed. And I was like, yeah, babe. And he's like, congrats, bad 500 more to go. I was like, <laughs> 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 obviously, obviously he said it in a, uh, in a good tone and we, we joked about it, but, um, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it really is crazy and it's a, uh, it's a pleasure and it's fun and an honor to watch. That's awesome, dude. And I know finally for me, like it, it meant, it means a lot to Ovi and probably means a lot to you and the rest of the veterans on the team as well to be playing meaningful, relevant playoff games down the stretch. This is not something we all predicted for the Capitals, but yet here you are. What has been the secret to this team's success to be this close to clinching a playoff berth? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we, we got a lot of character in the room. Um, 
a lot of guys that uh, aren't comfortable with going away or aren't comfortable with packing it in. Um, we've had some uh, some phenomenal goaltending. Um, we also have a lot of players that are uh, stepping into larger roles and have been learning along the way. Um, we got a first year NHL head coach. Um, and so I think we're really improving as the season's going here. And, um, you know, despite the goal differential and all that, um, we have guys that are willing to um, play the correct way defensively that makes it tough for other teams to score on us. And it makes it frustrating if they don't get their their cookies right away in the first half <laughs> of the game. So um, I think uh, I think it's it's winning hockey. And um, if we if we can play our game and we can stick with it and uh, we get the, the goaltending we've been getting, we're going to be uh, we're going to be right there in the end and have a chance to maybe make a run. Heck of a thousand games, TJ. Cheers to many more. Thanks for joining us here on The Drop. Thanks, gentlemen. Big thanks to TJ Oshie for joining us here on The Drop. That was a ton of fun. Let's have more fun. Uh, March Madness. Everyone's talking about the big tournaments. And everyone is also putting together brackets. We decided uh, we would show you, dear Drop viewer slash listener, if the NHL had a 16-team single elimination tournament based on the standings today... This is what it would look like. Here is wow. the NHL's March Madness bracket. Uh, any fun matchups from this bracket uh, jump out at you? Wish well, let's let's take it through for the folks on the audio side. So, be if you go, went one through sixteen, got rid of the conferences, just did it March Madness style, single elimination, one game decides it all. It'd be Bruins Red Wings one sixteen, then Dallas Edmonton in the next part of that little bracket, then Vancouver versus Los Angeles. The Rangers versus the Lightning, and the winners of those two would play each other. Colorado and Nashville in the 6 11 series. Winnipeg and the Vegas Golden Knights, 3 14. Carolina and the Leafs, 7 10. And the Panthers and the Flyers, 2 15. The thing that stands out for me most, dude, uh, these are all still conference matchups. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, what? Oh, okay. I don't know how the that, hell that's, that that's tidy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, mean, uh, I like the I like the Dallas Edmonton series. That's a that's a banger of a series to start things off. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and obviously Rangers or series. Light. It's a single elimination, so the game. Sorry, yeah, yeah the Rangers Dallas Lightning Edmonton game. A, Rangers Lightning would be a ton of fun too, and then you can have some fun with the Flyers and and Panthers as well. But I was I was really stunned that uh, that you end up with all of these conference matchups in the first <laughs> round. It does it does lend itself to some fun in the second round. Let's I mean the winner of the Bruins Red Wings plays the winner of Dallas and Edmonton. Uh, which is a ton of fun. Uh, so, you know, and then Vancouver and, and the Kings, you have the Rangers and Lightning in the other side of the bracket too. So you could end up with a, a 1994 Stanley Cup final rematch in the uh, quarterfinals between the Canucks and the Rangers. Um, listen, it, it'd be a, a ton of fun to have NHL March Madness. I am actually not uh, against the idea of there being single el elimination games. In fact, Arda, I have long been an advocate for playoff expansion and then making the seven versus 10, eight versus nine games, single elimination. I know that there are other ideas. We could do a two game series based on points earned, goal differential, what have you. Everybody's got their own solution. Um, but I've always been okay with the idea of uh, a, 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 it basically being a game seven to get into the playoffs. But I'll say this about playoff expansion, dude. Like I've, I've been long an advocate for expanding the playoffs to 20 teams. I think the idea that we have 32 teams now and, or, you know, and, and could have, you know, 34 before you know it um, and don't have an expanded playoff is insane. Um, leaving money on the table and, and really, you know, losing, losing a chance to emphasize more teams at a time when most fans are watching the most. Um, I think the Eastern conference right now is an argument against playoff expansion. Uh -huh. Being honest, like, Okay. Like the teams that you'd get in if you expanded it to ten teams right now, the 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 uh, play in round matchup if you did play it as a eight versus ten nine, uh, 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 sorry, a seven versus ten, eight versus nine matchup would be uh, Philly and the Islanders, Detroit and Washington. So I mean, like you get Ovi in, that's kind of fun, uh, and and Islanders Flyers is okay, but uh, all those teams that are chasing those spots right now are just so middling that I'm not sure they deserve to get in over in the West. It'd be the Kings and Blues in one series and VGK versus Minnesota, which could be an absolute bludgeoning series, to be honest with you, uh, in the other series. So 
as much as I love playoff expansion, there's also a part of me that's like maybe the season proves that it would just be like trying to scoop up teams that may or not may not be worthy of being in there uh, into the postseason. Well, whether or not you love playoff expansion, this time of year, you certainly love tournaments. We showed you our NHL March Madness bracket. That's not what we're going to deep dive <laughs> for the month of March or for the next 30 days. What we're going to do is we're going to present you a totally new tournament. Yes, it's sort of like the I, too, have a podcast. Yes, we, too, have a tournament for you for the next 30 days. We are calling it NHL March mascot that's right we are putting all the mascots in the national hockey league into a giant tournament single elimination <laughs> one shall survive and rule them all Whoa. even you new york rangers we'll get to that in a second but we decided to put all of them together uh in different divisions i'll start with the birds and aquatics division you have the blackhawks and tommy hawk versus the ducks and wild wing then the sharks and sj sharky taking on the canucks finn the whale the detroit red wings al the octopus the triumphant return of yeah, al the octopus I mean, as the three seed not even a plushie i mean it hangs from the ceiling but that's fine still taking on vgk's chance the gila monster not Chance the Raptor, as it was affectionately called. And then finally, Iceberg of the Penguins at the number four seed, taking on the number five seed, the traditional rivals, fight forever, uh, slap shot in the Washington Capitals. Oh my God. It's, it's like it's like, it's like like the Tar Heels and the Blue Devils in the first round of your tournament, <laughs> but getting Iceberg and slap shot there. Obviously, that is the money matchup in the Birds and Aquatics region, although I do think that Tommy Hawk Wild Wing matchup could be pretty interesting. Then the next bracket we have is... Uh, weird stuff arda the weird <laughs> stuff bracket these okay. are the mascots that are a little bit off kilter and honestly defy uh classification in our other regions uh the philadelphia flyers gritty in a 1-8 matchup with the montreal canadiens up i dude you we are temp the selection committee is tempting fate here with a potential one versus eight upset given how popular up is up is very popular uh, Sparky the Dragon of the Islanders against the Carolina Hurricanes, Stormy the Pig. Victor E. Green of the Dallas Stars, who, by the way, is a space alien, uh, taking on Bowie of the Seattle Kraken, who has personal beef with me and many other NHL commentators. Mm -hmm. uh, Tampa Bay Lightning's Thunderbug versus the Columbus Blue Jackets' Stinger in an all-insect matchup. That'll be a good one, too. Uh, the third division is the Cats division. Number one seed, Bailey of the Los Angeles Kings, taking on Hunter of the Oilers. Oh. Number two seed, Sabretooth of the Buffalo Sabres, taking on Nash of the Nashville oh my Predators. God. An ATV versus a rappelling from the ceiling, I believe. Oh, that that's going to... Yeah. See, that this is the thing. Like We're going to be debating a lot of different aspects <laughs> of these mascots, which is going to make it a lot of fun. Sparta Cat, your number three seed of the Senators, taking on Stanley C. Pan. Panther of the Panthers and number four versus number five Howler of the Yotes Nordy of the Wild. Yeah, Nordy, I, I, I believe a cat. I mean, I, I don't think that there's been clear etymology as to what Nordy is, but I believe Nordy is a cat. Finally, uh, the final uh, area, and this is where we get into some interesting classification, Arda. The mm -hmm. selection committee did a lot of debating about exactly what belonged here. This is the dogs and woodland creatures region. Uh, the one versus eight matchup in this region, Arda, is NJ Devil mm -hmm. of the Devils versus mm -hmm. the New York Rangers mascot. Keep in mind, they don't have an official one. So we've bestowed upon them Rempe the Giant. <laughs> Matt Rempe is the official mascot of the New York Rangers. Explain this matchup to the people at home. Uh, so NJ Devil, the Jersey Devil in lore, uh, lurks around the woodlands of yeah, where? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So they, that is the obvious woodland connection there for NJ Devil. Uh, and the New York Rangers, I'll be honest, pulling the curtain here. Uh, we thought for a while it might be Dancing Larry, mm. uh, assuming the mascot position here for the New York Rangers. Uh, but then a very wise man said, why don't we just make it Matt Rempe? And so we decided Rempy the Giant. Uh, the if woods. anyone has great so, uh, graphic design, if graphic design is your passion, feel free uh, to invent Rempy the Giant and send it to us. We might even just use it on the graphic. Who you knows? You know, at the end of the day, this is just like, just, you know, this is why you need a mascot, Rangers, because then you leave the door open for all the chicanery. Boston Bruins, Blades the Bruin against the Toronto Maple Leafs, Carlton the Bear. 
Uh, Louis of the St. Louis Blues against Mickey Moose of the Winnipeg Jets. I didn't even realize his name was Mickey Moose. Can they get away with that? I guess he's public domain now. And then uh, the Colorado Avalanche is <laughs> Bernie the St. Bernard against the Calgary Flames, Harvey the Hound. Bernie, a word of advice, go for the tongue. Absolutely, because that's that's the kryptonite right there. Go for the tongue, especially if you're an NHL head coach. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to debate this, Wish and I, for pretty much all of the matchups. And by the end of the big tournament in March, we will also have crowned an NHL March mascot victor. But sometimes Wish and I won't agree or come to a consensus. And in those situations, we will bring it to you so you can vote and help us choose a winner of certain rounds, especially feature matchups that no doubt will be extremely difficult to select. Yes, indeed. We're going to let you vote on social media to be the ultimate tiebreaker arbiter for these classic matchups <laughs> between Woodland Creatures, the New Jersey Devil, and Rempy the Giant. I can't, I can't, every, every, the, the thing that every hockey fan loves hearing, we're going to take this to arbitration. It's <laughs> yeah, the that's best. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the thing that hockey fans wait all year for, <laughs> summer arbitration hearings. All right, well, this should be fine. I, I, mascots yeah. are the best. Hopefully yes, the mascots are. that, uh, that see this bracket uh, lobby for their causes. We always like to hear from our furry friends. And uh, we'll have fun with this over the next couple of weeks. And we have fun with all of you. Thank you for watching the show. Keep it going in the comments. We'll be reading and interacting on YouTube, especially. But wherever you uh, consume this show, whether it's in audio form, wherever you get your podcasts or the NHL and ESPN YouTube, thank you very much. Every Tuesday and Friday, this is where you will find us. So have a great weekend and we will catch you again on Tuesday where the tournament shall begin. Bye.